thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and participating in our project Speaking Truth to Youth. I really appreciate it. I just yes. have a few questions I want to ask. First one is, what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? First of all, is uh, I grew up in, in the North, in Indiana, actually, but my relatives were all from the South. My father grew up in Alabama, my mother in Northern Florida, which is very much like Alabama. So I grew up going down South and seeing that society you know, every year or two. Uh, and then when I was a junior in high school, we had a church group that, that decided to go down to Mississippi and work at an all white college, but for poor people. Back then in Mississippi, everything was segregated. And so I thought, oh, that sounds like a really fantastic thing to do. So we went down there in 1964 in the summer. It's very close to Philadelphia, Mississippi. In the summer of 1964, three civil rights workers were murdered. Uh, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, not far from where we were. And during the time that we were there, when we arrived, the three workers were missing. They didn't know what, were, what had happened, but the local community, uh, the newspapers, civic leaders were all saying that this was a hoax and that these three civil rights, civil rights workers were probably partying up in the North and those of us from the north who were working at this church, you know, at this church college, were convinced that they had been murdered. I mean, it seemed very obvious to us that they had been kidnapped and perhaps murdered, uh, and that's what had happened. And so we were completely convinced. The local community was making things up, uh, and that was absolutely a, a game changer for me for the rest of my life. I mean. Essentially, we were in a community denying something really horrid, which had happened. We, we were there for two weeks. We left, uh, and, then, and then the bodies of the three civil rights workers were discovered. And I said at that time, I have to go back to Mississippi. And I did in 1966, 67, 68, every holiday, all summers. Uh, I worked down in Mississippi doing voter registration. Uh, working with youth who were now entering white schools and they needed to be tutored um, because they're, they were behind uh, educationally. Essentially, I, I worked for an organization called the Delta Ministry. That totally changed my life. And I decided at that time that I was going to have a life of social action, uh, that I was going to be a part of the solution, I hope, and I was going to commit myself to positive endeavors, and I have uh, since that time. We're still denying the truth. I, I feel that this is deja vu, you know, in terms of what's happening in our country right now, where there's a whole community of people, a whole party, actually, but a whole community of people who are denying the election and, and, and that sort of thing. It, it felt the same way as that back there. Uh, in Mississippi so long ago when uh, the community was denying a terrible reality. So what led you to the Government Accountability Project? During the time I was in Mississippi, I was arrested a couple times. One time for speeding, tailgating, reckless driving, and crossing the center line. I had a car that wouldn't even drive over 55 miles an hour, uh, and it was country roads. Uh, but I was delivering Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party newspapers to various churches, mostly, and delivering these newspapers. I was assistant editor of that newspaper. During that time, I got arrested uh, and got a lot of tickets. And then a few months later in Indiana, uh, I got a letter from a judge, actually, saying that I needed to appear in court to justify why my driver's license shouldn't be taken away because I had 27 points and you're allowed 15. And so I went down to the courthouse, you know, and I didn't have a lawyer. I just went to the court. The judge said, well, can you explain yourself? And I explained what happened and told the story. He said, son, it's an honor to get rid of every one of these points. What you were doing was a noble cause and I believe in it. So these are not going to be in your record. I've erased them. Thank you for coming in. Best of luck. And then I was leaving the courthouse 
and a lawyer, civil rights lawyer who I venerated, who I knew because I had taken welfare rights women in particular uh, to him to help represent them in their struggles. And I told him this, what I just told the judge uh, and why I was there. And he said, why didn't you call me? I'm your lawyer. I would do this. And I said, well, you know, I really don't have any, you know, a lot of, of money. Uh, and he said, it would be an honor to represent you. It was like with those sort of two experiences of what a lawyer could be or would be. I also was arrested in, in integrating a beach down in on the Gulf uh, in Mississippi. I didn't know it was a segregated beach and there was a black couple and myself were on the beach just relaxing and seeing if we wanted to bring kids down there from our tutorial center because they'd never seen the water, you know, the ocean. And so uh, we were trying to see if it's safe. And then we got arrested. You know, they put us away for 24 hours. That we weren't allowed to make a phone call. I was finally allowed to make a phone call. And I called the civil rights office. They called the head of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. He called the uh, longshoremen in um, Gulfport, Mississippi. And a lawyer came from Washington and met with the mayor and the mayor called the jail and said, let those civil rights workers out. We don't want any trouble down here. And so I got out and that was, again, a lawyer doing that sort of led me toward law, <laughs> especially after I'd gone to graduate school in theology, but they only had churches uh, for me to perhaps, I'm an ordained Methodist minister. But it wasn't my calling to have a church, and there weren't any other things to do. So then I went to law school after that. Those experiences really led me to the law, but it led me more to activism where you can really make a difference uh, in a significant way if you're strategic, hardworking, committed, and, and the like. So that's why, why I ended up going to law. And, and ending up with the Government Accountability Project was I was looking for public interest law, and I had heard about this organization. I convinced someone to raise my salary for a year to go there. I'd never been in their office. I just liked what they did. And so I, I convinced a funder, uh, a friend, but he, he had connections to money. So I convinced him to pay my salary for, for, I would work free for two months, and he would raise my salary for 10 months. And I said, after that time, they won't get rid of me. And that was, you know, I've been there ever since. What continues to motivate yeah. you, to give you courage, to guide you? I receive a lot of, of motivation from just the clients that I represent. I mean, whistleblowers are amazing people. I mean, obviously they're all different. Everyone's different. But whistleblowers, for one thing, they tend to be the hardest working people in a particular office. They tend to have the higher stand, highest standards, uh, ethically as well as professionally, which is what gets them in trouble. And they'll be just doing their jobs most frequently. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they get in trouble uh, because they want to be honest. They want to be truthful. They want to do a good job. They don't want to cut corners and they don't want to risk people's lives because often... Uh, especially in like nuclear engineering and the like, uh, nuclear quality assurance people, uh, there's a great risk <clears throat> if you don't do your job that many people can be harmed. So they get in trouble just for being truth tellers, just for being honest. They are so committed and dedicated and I get to work with them every day. I mean, lots of them. We've represented over 8,000, represent or help because we haven't represented all of them. But we've had over 8,000 whistleblowers just in our 40 so years of doing this. And they're amazing people. For one thing is that they're so committed to the truth as we are, and they're committed to reforming the issues that they're blowing the whistle on. So they're not just concerned about their own personal situation. And matter of fact, they've taken great risk about their careers and about their jobs. That's not the main focus. The main focus for them is to make a difference, is to have impact, to reform the problem that they've identified. And that happens to be the public interest of you know, our organization as well. So as long as we representing these people keep aligned you know, with 
their public interest as well, then you know then we can we can make a big difference, especially because the information they have is often quite uh, explosive actually, uh, and it can make a huge difference in terms of entire corporation, but also a big difference in in terms of the issue itself. Uh, we represented six hundred nuclear power plant employees during the first 12 years of our existence. And during that time, we ended up stopping the, the entire nuclear industry in the United States. I mean, we working along with the financial world because all of a sudden these uh, utilities weren't able to sell the bonds that they needed in order to build a nuclear power plant. Meanwhile, we worked with Wall Street to tell them about the problems. And, um, and that increased, of course, the cost of the bonds and also increased uh, the likelihood that they might not get those bonds. So we were able to have a huge impact, all because of these whistleblowers. And almost all of them were talking about safety. They're talking about quality control. They're not anti-nuclear. I mean, as an organization, we're not anti-nuclear. What we are is for truth telling. And if there's a problem, we don't care what it might be, but if there's a problem, uh, then we want to solve that problem. And that's what the whistleblowers want to do. We did a survey once that like 97% or something of our clients were pro-nuclear, and yet they were able to stop the industry in its track in the late 1980s. So I have a lot of help, and I think that's part of what motivates me as well, not only to be around truth-telling people, who are willing to yeah, risk their careers and risk their jobs uh, and lose their jobs and still feel good about it and still feel good and say, I would do it again. I mean, they all would do it again. That tells you something that even the ones who don't win would do it again because there's value in that experience of telling the truth, taking a risk, telling the truth and doing what's right. They feel good at looking themselves in the mirror in the morning. And so I'm surrounded with those people but on top of that, we can have a lot of impact with the information they come forward with. More impact than, than you can imagine. And we have a small organization relatively, you know, 30 or so people in our organization. And that's counting contractors, not all employees. We're having a huge impact here and there on the poultry industry. Um, we have impact in nuclear industry. We're having impact nuclear weapons. Uh, whistleblowers stopped the production of plutonium in this country three years before the end of the Cold War because of how dirty the process was of making plutonium. They had an impact on the arms race uh, because of that. We actually represent someone I can't talk too much about, but his disclosures uh, actually stopped Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East from getting from our country uh, nuclear technology that would allow them to, to make nuclear power plant and also make nuclear weapons. My next question is, what advice do you have for young activists or, or young people? For one thing is think big. I mean, you can have impact. You know, you can impact on issues that you care about. Having a life where you pursue uh, goals that have social benefit, whether it's stopping climate change or, or whatever it might be, that those are so worthy. So pursuing those goals. I remember anti-war demonstrations and you know, I felt like, oh my God, there's 500,000 of us it's, and we're still fighting the war. It's still going on. But eventually it stopped the war. I mean, the, one of the whistleblowers, Daniel Ellsberg, presented the evidence of how crooked it was that we ended up in that war and how the Pentagon and the president had lied to the American people repeatedly to stay in the war, even when we were losing it, and, and, and constantly lied. And he presented that evidence to the American people, which led to eventually the American people saying they don't believe they're leaders anymore, and we had to pull out of the war uh, because there was no longer any support. And that's just like one person. So one person can make a lot of difference. And one person coming forward makes a lot of difference, but it takes a whole group of people around them to help them have their voice. And we have to, you know, we need to represent them. We need to help them in terms of advising them on how to work with the media. 
just in terms of presenting their evidence in an understandable public public way it takes a whole group of people. We're all part of that of that movement of truth, and it's incredibly uplifting to be a part of that. I remember in in, in the eighties thinking at at that point that if I were to die at that point, which I certainly didn't want to do, uh, but if I were to die at that point, my life would be a net positive because of what you have to try to work with that too and not get disheartened by that. But if you have these larger goals in mind for what kind of world you want to have, then it's a worthwhile struggle. It's a worthwhile life. And it's a life having been worth living. Such great advice. It's important for them to know about whistleblowers for sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Louie. I really appreciate this conversation. It's been great to talk with you and good luck in all that you're doing. 